Welcome everyone to lecture 12. This series of lecture accompany and explain my book Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, a Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I am a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You can find more information in the description. It's available on Amazon as a paperback and also as an ebook. We are still on chapter one, disorders of water balance, hyponatremia and hypernatremia. And uh, we are doing now case studies in dysnatremias and this is part two. Let's jump right in. Case number five, severe hyponatremia. Here we have a 60 year old man who weighs 80 kilogram presenting with a seizure. Serum sodium is very low, 105. He has been on sertraline for major depression. Sertraline is an SSRI. Some of you know it as Zoloft. So he's been taking sertraline for major depression and was started on hydrochlorothiazide for hypertension one week ago. What is the best approach to management? Here we have severe hyponatremia resulting in seizures. So therefore, this is a medical emergency. What do we have to do? Water restriction? No, we have to give 3% hypertonic saline. So using anything else, 0.9 normal saline, dolvaptan is inappropriate. Well, we are going to use 3% hypertonic saline. We would like to raise serum sodium by 5 because we have an emergency. How much do we use? Well, we use the formula that we've used before volume of IV solution of the infusate of the 3% saline. This is the infusate, what we're going to infuse. So we determine our desired sodium, which is 110. This is 5 from the 105. And we know how much sodium in the solution we're giving. It's 513. I told you before, remember uh, the 513. This is the content of sodium in 3% saline. Total body water is 80 times 0 0.6 because this is a man. And we multiply by 1,000. So we get the answer in milliliters. And the answer is 468 milliliters. Since this is an emergency, since the patient is having a seizure, we're going to give the first 100 mLs of this solution over 50 minutes, okay, due to seizures. Now, the remainder, the other 365, we will give slowly over 10 hours, uh, maybe at a rate of 35 mLs an hour. Uh, we, and, and then we're going to check serum sodium every two to four hours. Um, like we said before, if the seizures continue, we can give another 100 mLs over 15 minutes. The goal will not change. We would like to raise sodium by 6 to 8 in the first 24 hours, no more than that, okay? And in, in the next uh, 24 hours, another 8. And 10 is definitely the limit for the first 24 hours. Case number 6. Hyponatremia due to carpimazepine. This is very common. Carpimazepine, what does it do? It causes SIADH. Okay. 55-year-old woman with chronic hyponatremia due to carbamazepine. She presents with a fall. Serum sodium is very low, 120. Serum osmolality is 256. So this is hypoosmolar hyponatremia, like what you would expect with SIADH. Urine sodium is 45 in SI. SIADH usually is above 40, it's high, so it's 45. Urine osm is high, 526, so it all fits SIADH from the carbamazepine. Weight is 60. What options do we have for the treatment of, of chronic hyponatremia? Note, the case number five we just discussed was an emergency case, okay? Here is just chronic. The patient is basically asymptomatic except for the fall. So again, the likely diagnosis, this fits SIADH, so we have hypoosmolar hyponatremia with high urine sodium and high urine osmolality. So are we going to give isotonic saline or just do water restriction and hope for the best? No. Like we said, when urine osmolality is high, is above 500, it's unlikely to work. Okay, so you can do and you should do fluid uh, water and fluid restriction, but that in and of itself is not enough. This is not an emergency because the patient has chronic hyponatremia that recently has worsened. 
Dolvaptan is a very appropriate option, works really well for SIADH. Uh, you have to do it in the hospital, so you start with 15 milligrams a day. Like I said before, you just try it for one dose at a time, and the patient, while on Dolvaptan, should have free access to water. Don't give it to someone who's comatose, okay? And then serum sodium is checked every six hours. Alternatively, you can easily use 3% saline, and if we calculate using the same equation I mentioned in case number 5, we need 292 ml to raise serum sodium by 5, and this should be infused slowly, 20 to 30 ml an hour, no need to go any faster than that, this is again chronic hyponatremia. Case number 7, hyponatremia and excessive water drinking. Here we have a 40-year-old man with paranoid schizophrenia. He admits to excessive water drinking. He presents with gait disturbance and a serum sodium checked in the emergency room and it was found to be 122. He was started on fluid restriction 1200 ml a day and his serum sodium was checked every four hours. You notice that his urine output all of a sudden is 1400 ml and his serum sodium has risen over eight hours to 132. What do you do in this case? So this is someone with primary polydipsia that is now fluid restricted and is starting to urinate, to have polyuria. So this patient with primary polydipsia was placed on fluid restriction. When that happened, uh, this patient antidiuretic hormone is already suppressed from all that water intake and now he's just urinating. It's a similar situation to someone with diabetes insipidus. So here we have water diuresis that leads to overcorrection of hyponatremia. So what do we do? Okay, anything you're doing to correct hyponatremia has to stop. So you stop the saline if you're giving saline. If you're giving 3%, you stop that. If you're giving tolvaptan, you stop it. You take the patient out of fluid restriction. Let them drink. You start D5W at 3 ml per kilo per hour, and you need to give IV desmopressin 1 to 2 mics every 8 hours until we reach our goal. So what was our starting serum sodium? Well, it was 122. Add to that 6 to 8, so you get 128, 130. Once you reach that goal, you can stop. But as long as the patient is urinating, continue to replace. So here, this is an example when you really need to check serum sodium every two to four hours. You need to stay on top of this, otherwise you can end up with severe overcorrection of hyponatremia. So again, when you get someone with primary polydipsia, be careful about food restriction. Okay, take it easy. It's, it's chronic. You don't need to correct fast. Maybe you don't use fluid restriction. And if, if you do... Uh, limited. Don't do it like 1,200 ml per 24 hours. Maybe two liters a day is fine because those guys, maybe they're, they're drinking five, six, ten liters a day. Case number eight. Here we have hypernatremia and enteral nutrition. 72-year-old man was admitted to the ICU with pneumococcal pneumonia. He was intubated, started on mechanical ventilation, and then three days later he was started on two feeding, enteral nutrition. He was given free water, 50 ml uh, of free water, down his NG tube every six hours. His serum sodium rose gradually from 142 to 155 over the next three days. What do you do for his hypernatremia? This patient is critically ill. He has no free access to water. He's not going to get up and drink water if he's feeling thirsty. So we commonly see hypernatremia in patients on enteral nutrition. So what do we do? Well, we increase free water. So he's getting 50 ml over six hours. Well, change that maybe to 200 ml every four to six hours and see what happens. If this is ineffective, well, start the 5W. How do you calculate? Like we said, you calculate free water deficit and you add insensible losses and uh, electrolyte free water clearance and then you do it accordingly and you can split the volume between oral and between IV. Case number nine, hypernatremia in an older adult. Here we have an 85-year-old woman with advanced dementia sent to the emergency department from a skilled nursing facility due to uptundation. Her serum sodium was extremely high, 181. This happens when these patients stop drinking, stop eating, while their loop diuretic furosemide, torsemide is continued. 
So we have a sodium of 181. Her urine volume is very low because she hasn't been drinking one liter. Urine sodium is 10, urine potassium is 12. She weighs 56 kilograms only. How do we manage her hypernatremia? Let's calculate first component. What is water deficit? We know her current total body water is 56 times 0.5, so this is 28. Her current serum sodium is 181. We divide that by 140 minus 1, and we get a water deficit of 8.2 liter. Is this the total uh, uh, volume of water needed? No. We have to add electrolyte free water clearance. And the equation you can see on the screen, you need to know urine sodium, you need to know urine potassium. I explained that in lecture four and five, and I'll provide a link. And we get 0 0.87 liters. And we add the 8.2 to the 8, uh, to the 0 0.87 to 0 0.8, which is insensible losses. And what do we get? Well, we get 9.87 liters. Now, you're not going to give this over one day, of course. You're going to divide this maybe over three to four days. So you're going to start with uh, maybe a D5W, 125, 150 mLs per hour. And then you measure the sodium every six to eight hours and you change your rate accordingly. Case number 10, polyuria and lithium. Here we have a 44-year-old man with manic depressive disorder. He's been stable on lithium for three years. Now he's complaining of polyuria, frequent urination. Urine collection showed a volume of 3.2. We said anything over 3 liters is what? Polyuria. Urine sodium, 35. Urine potassium, 33. Urine protein, not much considered normal, 30 milligram per 24 hours. Nothing, no, no glucosuria, okay? And uh, urine osmolality is 180, so it is low. Serum sodium is 144. Serum osmolality goes with high uh, serum sodium, so it's a little bit high, 302. How would you manage his condition? So this patient has nephrogenic diabetes in insipidus due to lithium. This is the most common drug that can cause nephrogenic DI. You can see that sodium is at the upper range of normal because he's able to drink. If you cut off his water axis, then his sodium will start to rise. But in, in this case, he's able to drink, so you get a sodium 144, usually 144, 145, uh, at the upper range of, of normal. Uh, you can see that urine osmolality is low, like you would expect with, with someone with nephrogenic DI. He's polyuric urine volume above three, and there's really no evidence of solute diuresis or osmotic diuresis. And you can tell that just by looking at the urine sodium and urine potassium. Urine sodium 30, 35, urine potassium 33. But if you want to prove that uh, there's no solute diuresis, you can do the calculations. If uh, you calculate the electrolyte free water clearance, you get 1.7. So about half the urine volume is electrolyte, half water. So really, we don't have a solute diuresis. If you calculate the C osm, which is the osmolar clearance, you get 1.9 liter. And if you want to calculate the free water clearance, all you need to do is to take the total urine volume, 3.2 liters minus osmolar clearance, 1.9, and you get 1.3 of water clearance. I know I'm going fast here, but I'm going to provide a link to lecture number four and number five when we went into details explaining osmolar clearance, free water clearance, and electrolyte free water clearance. Now, in this patient with chronic nephrogenic DI, we have two options. Either we can find an alternative to lithium or we can use a muloride. A muloride is a weak diuretic. It's a potassium sparing diuretic, but it has a unique characteristic. It, it blocks the sodium epithelial channel. Okay, and this is the main entry site for lithium in the principal cells of the collecting tubule. So sometimes that's very helpful. And I'm going to stop here, and in the following lecture, we're going to discuss uh, some more interesting cases. See you then.